Thank you. We will continue our discussion after the presentation of the morning. We will continue to deepen the topic on best practices of ASM. We have both national and local panel, which is united here with representatives from Cote d'Ivoire, DR Congo, Niger, and country from OECD countries. The objective will be in the next 90 minutes to allow a sharing of experience on formalization strategies that have worked in Cote d'Ivoire in the diamond sector as discussed yesterday in the other regional country. We we'll also try to specify the role and impact of standard and impact of national initiatives that have been put in place around the supply, responsible supply chain, RSN, the use of chemicals such as mercury, and be able to understand the specific expectation of international buyer of the gold market while underscoring the importance of coordinated approach for uh, both programs, both national and international programs working in the area. We spent time yesterday uh, dealing with uh, mentioning the need to have a coordinated action, a coordinating mechanism which applies to both local and international private sector. The role of the objective is to feed the ongoing uh, exchange, discussion, debate, and go in this country as a way to implement the national ASM plan and also help the Niger in terms of putting in place a reform of their mining code as well as for Burkina Faso in developing its mining code. So we have, uh, let's say, a movement which is taking place concurrently in the sub-region. So this will help us uh, feel, feel the discussion. So we have, the panel has five people. We try to have multi-stakeholders representation with the government, the private sector, civil society, and international institution. And myself, Zovik Benada, without further ado, uh, let us have a return of experience of a program that is ongoing since several years in Nigeria, Congo, with a presentation by me, Yves Bawa, which is the regional director, regional, the national regional director for PAC project, which is being developed in DR Congo and other Central African countries. We will be explained presenting the program you are representing, which is working on the ground for several years um, in order to achieve a responsible AS mining sector, promoting a responsible supply chain in mineral. What we want you to do is to take us through the program and tell us why it is successful, give us some figures and evidence on the number of artisan and participation, how the promotion of production has been achieved. Thank you, Louis. Good morning to the house. Let me thank the organizer for giving me the platform to share an experience on, of a system combining traceability and due diligence called uh, ITSI. So my name is Bawa, working for the development of a, in a project called PACT. The project is based in Washington, D.C. I would just start telling you why the international development organization have in the stake in the mining sectors. Difficult to take the floor after the submission of different experts as we have all the same working environment and the same the experiences. But so as the ASM is important, we need to keep repeating the same thing again and again. This is, the system is called it, 
its key uh, called sending as it retains uh, supply chain initiatives. So it's uh, bringing together the refinery, bringing together a refinery of mineral coming from country. Working, working with TIC uh, that have put that chain system in place. These are a few figures, photos, that show that this situation is the same across the world. The second photo is the government system identifying the package, collecting all the information, labeling, bar barcode, with specific information, a unique number, uh, affected to a single unique, a single uh, mine, and this information is traveling from the mine side up to the final user. I will show you how it's happening. This is a package uh, labeled, labeled. Uh, this other part is the local multi-stakeholder monitoring committee. So, uh, we can have the civil society, governments playing a role. The civil society playing its role. Across the world, we have seen the statistics. I'm not going to go back on them. Uh, several people made a presentation on living condition, working condition, and it's time for national organization, the government, to get interested when it comes to investing for improvement of living condition, working condition in the sector. Why do we put that system in place? The system is about a joint system of the industry so that from the mine to the finished product, the issue of due diligence may be tackled. The local requirement is a starting point, but it should be aligned with the need of the end user. Second, we provide information because uh, the people At uh, the level of the smelter, people should show clean hands. The, the buyers listed, listed in that is state of America should pass their audit, carry out their audit, and make a report on the demand of the American, based on the American legislation request, is to open the mineral of the mineral of the Great Lake region to the international market. The system is working in free, at free level. We have the government of the country, country working in Dia Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. What's happening? The initiative signed an MOU with the government on its purpose and the role of different parties. The people working are uh, government officials uh, that have been delivered a specific training and collecting the data that's relevant for the system. 
There is also a capacity building program for those officials and strengthen state authority on this term of control. We'll go back to, on the issue discussed, which is formalization and legalization. This is where we can provide a few examples. On the other side, we have the industry. The industry is not only the final industry, but it's sad with the miner, uh, the diggers, the excavators. And the excavator might wonder why he should participate in the system. What is his stake? What is his interest? Yesterday, we've listened to the uh, stakeholder call collector. They are key. If they don't participate, they are not involved. Which, what thing will uh, divert or prevent the collector to come and pick the product and cross the border. So the mining activities is taking place at different level. There is also the role of civil society. The most of the time, uh, civil society is seen as a problem. When we see them, we are putting, uh, accusing them for wanting to, of wanting to publish a report in order to undermine the system. It's, uh, yes, that's good that civil society will criticize some fact, make report for government to take actions uh, to bring the appropriate measures. There, is, there are committees established to monitor. I can take you into the detail of the, on the role of that committee, the local committee that allows for a daily analysis of the production in the supply chain. This happened at local level. It's addressed the issue. Some problem may not have solution. The fact of identifying them, discussing them, uh, proposing solution is also key. So, in short, in GIA Congo, we have the excavators, the traders, and the processing entity. What we do is to collect information, carry out the due diligence by the critical point. We talked about success factor, but I will combine them. Where we have that key point is at level of the smelter. Uh, level of the mill. What happened? The mill, after the international requirement, the mill were not able to get supplied in the region if they lacked the information on the origin of the mineral, requiring that they speak, spoke to the processing entity, the trader have found the motivation because it was about selling mineral. The large control, the significant control would take place at the mill level. The final users should make their report because the mill should pass, make to carry out the audit in order to be certified conflict free. There is a complex uh, management structure. We have government, the government, uh, and the uh, governance committee, secretarial field officers. And there is a mechanism for conflict resolution. So, because incident is that dispute may arise between different companies, and third party team can come and control. And multi stakeholders committee involving several international organizations uh, is also present. This is a case study, practical from DIA Congo, from 2011 to date. The, to the production in 2011 before the implementation of the system, the annual production was around three tons for the three type of mineral per year, uh, 2,000 tons. In 2016, however, 
2000, we have moved from 2,000 ton up to 12,000 ton. So there is traceability, it's possible. Currently, within the system, we know that the artisanal ASM sector is dynamic. The shifter are evolving. We can have today 10 uh, excavators participating in the system, miners, working on over 5,750 sites. But so last year it was over 75, depending on the reality of the market. The key point to take away as a success factor is the involvement of the market. People should have the motivation that which will attract them to participate. Of course, there is regulation, but we cannot stop somebody between two borders because if I succeed in smuggling. If I smuggle the mineral, I can make more money in the other country, uh, more than in my, my country. So regional harmonization is important. The issue due diligence, traceability, responsible supply uh, should be placed in within a regional vision and listen the uh, stakeholders in the industries because they know what how things are going on. Merci. Avant que tu te que tu t'enfuis, j'aurais deux petites questions pour toi. Uh, Two small questions. Uh, Wednesday, we briefly covered the issue of local committee, which are important example of a risk monitoring entity at local level. Can you tell say a few words on it and your opinion on the cooperation, good fair cooperation between companies and NGOs? How can this be implemented in the gold mining sector? Well, first of all, regarding the monitoring um, structures, uh, the speakers talked about it yesterday. It's always hard to uh, get the international organization or government organization to be permanently on, on the site. But the requirement asks us to give report on each happenings in the value chain. And if it's an incident, we need to give a report on that. But since there are communities that live on the site, it's part of their lives. Then in the system, we thought about uh, bringing on board all the stakeholders, civil society and the state and the administrative uh, agencies of the government and also international organizations which are in these areas so that they can discuss on how the system should be built and they can write uh, incident report if the things are not working well. In fact, it is something that's, that happens at local level and they even went further at province level. They put in place what we call the basket fund for the social development activities. They developed projects, they built hospitals, they built uh, bridges to facilitate, I mean, based on the tonnage exported. And for the Colton, this is also uh, applicable. In fact, they monitor and report on real fact now regarding the collaboration uh, on, in, in the gold area. In fact, I recognize the, uh, the issue recognize the various type of mineral resources because um, artisanal mining is very complex. It's easier to uh, identify 50 kilo bag of coltan than identifying gold that has a value which is 10 times or 20 times uh, more important than that one. So, and, and the most essential on the old gold market is that before you put in place a real uh, traceability system that is effective and sustainable, there should be uh, involvement of companies. Uh, before doing that, they do what we call the buying into the system. The right thing we give regulation to participate in the system, you do this, this or that. And after that, we do due do, do diligence on companies. Six months before the company came, what they were they doing? What was their connection? Because the traceability is not only on the product. 
We also need to know a lot about the per person who is, or the actor, is it not involved in financing uh, groups that are illegal? So we need to know all about that group. And the key element is the market. The buyer of the gold need to be motivated in participating in the business if it is the taxes or the funding. And if we need to identify all these issues before it starts with well. well. Thank you very much, Eve. You can go back to your seat. I thank you for your presentation and your contribution. Now, let's move on to the second presentation, uh, which I said will give more precision on the uh, expectation on the gold market. It's Manuela Boque. She be working in the Association of the uh, Gold Market, and she is in charge of monitoring and implementation of the uh, responsible gold program developed by her association, and part of her activities consists in supporting the banks and the major uh, actors on the international gold market for them to understand how the sector is operating in a responsible manner. So we want to know what the LBMA uh, group has been uh, implementing things to uh, foster the responsible gold market operations and also understand what your association represents at the international level. Well, thank you. It's the first time I'm doing the presentation in French, so uh, well, uh, I will ask you to help me oh, uh, correct the mistake. I would like to give you a uh, presentation on our association. We have been es established by the Bank of England to uh, ensure integrity of the London gold market. We are the biggest market in the world which sells and buy gold and silver. So through uh, many means of media, we ensure that the participant comply with the rules and conditions to sell or trade on the market. We have many activities, but today I will uh, more specifically focus on the list of refiners who uh, were able to success successfully get a certification to demonstrate that with their activities, they comply with the objective requirements, like a minimum tonnage per year, but also condition based on the five stages of the OECD, which Lois presented earlier on. We have more than 70 refiners on the list, and each of them uh, demonstrated that they were able to put in place a system for the management and identification of risks that enable them to conduct their activity in the more ethical and responsible manner. They are represented all over the world in more than 30 countries and are were Responsible Gold Program was established in 2012 and is, is I mean, um, stems from the five OECD state steps. And in our action, we have two objectives. The first is to give more assurance to uh, companies uh, on the downstream as well as their clients and to make them understand that their gold uh, was produced in a responsible manner. And the second is to help the refiners to establish their management system and guide them in the development of their responsible and respective practices. We are recognized by many institutions and organizations like uh, as, as an example of best, best practice in everything that has to do with responsible uh, uh, good guide, guidance. And uh, for our refiners, every year they have to provide a report on their management system by uh, complying with the five steps uh, of uh, EOECD. And every year this report will be submitted to auditors who will verify independently the systems of these uh, companies, I mean the refiners, 
they also must, to, must show the public that they have complied with the requirement. So they need to publish this report on their site. And we also publish the same report on our website to facilitate the access uh, to such report by the public to verify the activities of these refiners. And in addition to that, the refiners must communicate to all the value chain about their policies on the responsible sourcing. And when they identify that in the uh, supply chain, they are high risk. They must uh, consider the due diligence and go further, like uh, they must conduct visits on the, the uh, site that are likely to be problematic. So this is the presentation on the, what refiners do. Now the question is, what does all this have to do with the artisanal mining sector? The capacity of the current refine, ref, refinery is larger than the um, production capacity of the mine sites, which means the refiners are, are kind of losing uh, an opportunity cost when it comes to their unit price. So they're trying to find means to become more effective and find more opportunities in the artisanal mining sector and the industry in general has recorded some progress from a sphere of the risk phase to a better understanding phase whereby they can better manage the risk mitigation. And at this moment, we have two refiners who have activities in Côte d'Ivoire. Two out of 70 is a, a very small. So there is an opportunity to increase that number. And we uh, trust the initiatives and the commitment of all the sector. And with this, we make it possible. We also, we've also seen that in the West Africa region, is more and more on the spotlight of the uh, refiners in general, and there are great opportunities to be more responsibly committed. And we have many refiners who have gone further than that, and they are currently working with organizations on risk initiative projects. And they have come back and are publishing their successes and progress record on the website. In spite of all this, we can still see that the media is still critical for um, the artisanal mining sector. The users of I mean, the companies and the users are more and more interested in the origin of such material. So the banks and the companies, like the major technology companies, are under the pressure as to demonstrate that they are, in a responsible manner, engaged all over the value chains and, and be, instead of looking at this as a burden, they look at it as an opportunity, a way to differentiate themselves from other companies to demonstrate that they go further and that they are more uh, engaged with the local communities. And this is related to the social and organizational responsibility and all this is published on their respective website and it is good news for the artisanal mining sector, which means that there are more and more opportunities ahead. And the role of our association, therefore, is to ensure that there is communication between the various actors on the market and that the opportunities are maximized to the most. 
and of the rest, recent days, uh, we have accorded excellent and laudable initiatives, and we are in the position to help because we can create a link between refiners and organizations so that they can work together to clearly demonstrate that uh, they are encourage, encouraging this initiative, and particularly in the um, artisanal mining sector. And we also re realize that the document that we prepared to help the refiners was more adapted for a big scale, large scale production or for LSM production. But we realized that it can demotivate uh, refiners as to uh, commit themselves in to uh, artisanal mining activities. So we are working with groups in all the organizations and refiners as well for uh, uh, documentation that is more adapted to artisanal sector. And if we show our support and encourage those initiatives, it shows the market that we are supporting the uh, artisanal, uh, artisanal mining sector. Uh, I, I talked about how we, uh, uh, we fear the risk, and uh, now, now from there, we, we have now moved from a more constructive attitude where we don't fear risk anymore, and we reduce them. And we've seen that the expectations of the companies is increasing. And a substantial part of all this, as presented earlier on by Patrick, is the European legislation on uh, mineral-related conflict. It is important because it strengthens what the industry sector is doing currently. And the most interesting with that legislation is that it does not go into the market, enter the market with other standards. The legislation is already supporting and promoting the excellent work that the stakeholders in the industry are doing. So if we make an effort and we continue to work very well and sh demonstrate that we take the dual diligence uh, seriously, it could be good for us and we will not have legislation that may be coming up and will not be as quickly, uh, I mean quickly adopted as our standard are. And so for that, we conducted an evaluation of our guide uh, as compared to the OECD guide and see if there are some areas of uh, um, uh, improvement. And we are happy to see that, that it can also be in line with European Union legislation. We also more and more see that the Swiss refiners are more and more engaged with ACM project, I mean LSM project. And we have three uh, refiners from Cote d'Ivoire, and this is encouraging because refiners are showing that it is possible, and we also want others to come and see if there are opportunities for them to be involved. The industry uh, very quickly responds to opportunities, and they can identify areas where a lot of progress has been recorded so the message I would like, uh, like to leave to you before leaving is that on our side there is a demand for more opportunities and we would like to engage with artisanal mining sector and the progress that we've already seen is encouraging to many extent. And I think that all our efforts can be rewarded. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Manuela, and congratulations for the French. You see, you didn't have to worry about the French. I would like to say a couple of things. It is said that uh, two refiners uh, are, are um, using, uh, uh, being supplied Cote d'Ivoire, but we have many, generally speaking, and uh, we saw it in our workshop. The Afroian production is channeled to many countries, and so potentially other refiners, if they see the effort, in line with the due diligence, they will understand that they need not to go to other countries, but it can come from other countries as well. And also, you need to understand the progressive aspect in the implementation of the guide, 
it is as complicated and for the government it's hard to regulate and for international market it's, under, it's hard to understand. However, the trend is that there is more and more transparency and the objective is that all the stakeholders support that movement to improve the uh, supply chain. The ultimate goal is to uh, uh, bring the artisanal uh, miners closer to the international actors. And we also heard that in Cote d'Ivoire, the artisanal production was potentially very, more very much important than what was officially recorded. That's the case for Niger and Burkina Faso. So there is a lot of room for improvement. And once again, this forum is here to help us improve on all these programs. Now let's move on to the third speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Bertrand, Yves Bertrand, the Align for uh, Responsible Mining. Uh, they've been working in America, in Africa, in Asia. Can you present to us the uh, uh, characteristics of this program? Because it will be interesting for us to understand the uh, progress of that production over the years and what are the lessons that you can draw from the activities on the ground. Why is it working? Why is it that the miners are still committed? And the last one is that you can maybe tell us how that program is articulating with the OECD guide. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, good morning to all of you. Today I will talk about an experience which happened over the last three years in Burkina Faso and Senegal, and I will try to link it with the activities that we conduct in general. First of all, a uh, few words. This Alliance for Responsible Mining is an NGO which is based in Colombia, and it has an international uh, brand that have to certify uh, the gold into an equitable gold, which means that the gold is produced in satisfactory conditions, I mean socially and environmentally and legally, and in action to uh, this good practice, the miners receive a minimum guarantee price and, and they receive uh, a development premium that is added to that price. And so we help the community to develop in, uh, some community project. The um, mutual uh, benefit principle of that standard is to bring to the miners some guarantees and it also help the industry to have a high quality of origin and traceability because the standard uh, mainstream um, due diligence of OECD as well as total traceability uh, in, uh, uh, I mean from the extraction point to the first sale and also traceability uh, at a uh, user's level. And it helps to build a story behind the gold that is produced, which means that somebody who is coming to buy uh, a, a, a ring, a golden ring, uh, at least the jeweler should be able to say where this is coming from and in which uh, on which mining site or country it was produced. And today we have mines that are certified in Latin America, in Asia. Can we hope that we will have uh, certified mines in Africa? And I will tell you about the first experience of such thing in West Africa. The first experience started in Senegal, Mali, and Burkina Faso. It was funded by the French Fund for uh, Global Environment, and Louis was a key actor in the decision on that project, and also by Jeff, because uh, the project has a component on the reduction of mercury uh, emissions. It's a project that was uh, developed by a Canadian uh, 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 company, and all of this was coordinated by UNIDO, and the project is now completed today. Instead of giving you a lengthy description of what we did in general. I will just show you a portion of the result base today here. You see a um, diagram which apparently looks complicated. 
In fact, it's about all the chapters that covers the standard. Um, and, and down there, we have something that has to do with legality, the paying of taxes, the um, uh, scope of the mining uh, organizations. We work with them, and oh, there's another part that talks about uh, environmental condition for the production, and all oh, the blue part has to do with human rights, social protection, and working conditions in general. And the diagram shows you two analysis that we conducted with a tool which is specific to our actions. It helps us uh, to see how the mining organization recorded some progress over the time based on the criteria. And we see that there's, uh, there is a number of progress that are interesting and others that are more complicated. So uh, you can see that there's a lack of discrimination. Uh, and we have made a lot of progression because the chapter on which we did not have a lot of problem, people understood it. And there was a kind of natural accept acceptance. And this was uh, with a cooperative in Burkina Faso. And it's the first mining cooperative that was established in the country officially. And today is a model that the Burkina people uh, intend to uh, replicate because it gave some promising results. And internally, we worked on the quality of the monitoring and the funding. And all this helped to acquire the material and improve the technique. So we addressed many issues through this work, and it is uh, an, an intensive work that we conducted. We also see that there are some parts that are more complex. For instance, the chapter on the monitoring of gold extracted, it's uh, 1.4 on the traceability of uh, gold within the organization recorded some progress, but still not satisfactory because sometimes we have a uh, documentation problem. They are there's a problem like illiteracy that are specific to the mining sector. We don't have always all the skills or competency to do everything in a mining organization, but with the willingness of all the actors, we are able to record good results, which are encouraging. What can we draw, draw from all these parameters instead of uh, uh, going to sit up there? I would just go to the ground, go to site. This is what we were doing on a daily basis. We were oriented on, on the site, on the ground. So how do we do to all identify the good site? There is a problem on the knowledge of the sector, and it was the first problem uh, on, on the ground was to know how to identify these areas, as we, we do have in Senegal uh, more than 100 sites. And in Burkina Faso, we have about 1,000 sites. We're not very certain about the number. But you need to know the sector very well, and this takes time and also help the mining authorities to better uh, know and master the uh, mining environment. And sometimes we had some technical problem because as a result of lack of mean, and um, it becomes a problem on the willingness to know the, the, the sector very well and traceability, just to mention a few factors, but more importantly, the legal framework and policies that were developed in these countries are fundamental. We've seen yesterday the intervention of Mr. Somme on the legal aspect of, uh, of the mining sector in Burkina Faso, and we see that there is a difficulty as to the access of mining authorization because there is a large occupation of this territory by major or let's say LSM research permits. So we still need more extension or more flexibility for small scale miners. Now, regarding the organizational capacity, of course, it is necessary to have a permanent network, and then we see how we deploy ourselves when there is a dispersion of sites over the territory, I mean areas that may be accessible after two days' drive or many house walk. Some areas are very difficult in terms of access, which are not visited by mining authorities, and which are had to access. Uh, 
We also need uh, an, uh, a notion about the adaptation to all this because we have seen that the mining practices differ from one country to others, uh, even in West Africa. So we need to adjust ourselves to the local practices and realities. For instance, on traceability, it is very important to see how gold or the product is distributed, and how is it uh, uh, treated or processed, uh, what, what, what are the agents or stakeholders involved. It goes from the mining team and it goes to the uh, grinder groups and those who um, uh, um, melt it. And, you know, we need to respect all these uh, processes and the teams or groups that are, that are involved. Now, regarding the work that we did on the certification mm -hmm. aspect, we realized that this came represents a lot of efforts on the part of the cooperative that was established as a result of the goodwill uh, um, of the communities and villages. Uh, and so the certification helped to get results when we are certified. And here we have a problem because all this effort are not remunerated immediately. Now we need to find some incentive measures or methods that help to keep alive the interest of the miner because he lives on a daily basis and he wants to have a first line economic interest. This is why we try to work on the technical aspects of trying to improve the processing um, capacities and the performances. And the lesson that we draw from all this is that we need to have an innovative funding uh, scheme and we can go and look for it with uh, commercial uh, uh, actors and then we are touching a very important aspect in our project which means that we're not working only with the mining operators, we are working with all the actors in, in, the, in the value chain. The first uh, uh, buyer, the second buyer, the final buyer and maybe this one might have an interest to see that uh, uh, sector operating as we've seen it with Manuela. We can also have some financial support along the uh, value chain or the supply chain. So these are things that we have kept uh, 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 in that uh, uh, area that can be deployed of the region. Now here we, we have some images on the work that we did. We uh, work to achieve technical integration, like a, a machine for the mining, uh, female mining workers. Uh, we have many other examples. Uh, the integration of these uh, female mining operators was very important because they were around the mining uh, site, but they were not going um, on the site, and they were not into the mining organization groups. So in doing this, we try to trigger the interest of these women to integrate the, uh, the group as specific special members. And today, this cooperative, through that activity, has many women. And man, here we are talking about 130 female mine, uh, artisan miners who pay the contribution and also benefit from the services of the cooperative. Now, on the right side, uh, it, it shows that we have worked a lot on IGN and security conditions, and in Senegal we worked on the establishment of uh, hygiene and safety committee that can now organize and implement a risk management strategy with the miners. And so it's very important as it will have to um, empower these miners, give them the operational capacity to manage their risk which is something which is something evolving within the organization. And then I will stop on the last picture uh, um, uh, below on the uh, on the right. We worked on diversification because uh, one of the uh, stakes in the mining sector is to be integrated with uh, rural activities, and we realized that the natural model is an integrator model, which means that there is, will be a village organization that will develop uh, activity, mining activities along with uh, agricultural activities. And so we help them to develop a program to diversify their revenues. And today we have a community garden of 
6,500 square meters managed by women on the left side, and this garden today is autonomous and is being developed because the cooperative is financially providing support uh, for the, acts, for the uh, acquisition of inputs, and they will get by the money later uh, at the end of the activity. Well, the capitalization factor here is to work on mining zones. In fact, we are looking at a feature of this type of project as a, a mining cluster because we have a synergy synergetic effect between the mining operators. It helped them it help us to see how the mining operators from one side to the other can help each another one. And the fact of talking about mining cluster is very important because when we consider technology transfer and uh, 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 support in, uh, in with material and equipment, we can see that they are service suppliers and equipment providers who also benefit from the possible improvement of the process that we can uh, um, induce. So there is some economic uh, tissue, economic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, landscape that will uh, drive the miners to also learn to do other things. That why not doing, going also into exploration? So there is a kind of demand that is taking shape here and this is extremely important to capture uh, when we look at the mining sector as an economic um, uh, sector that can uh, be useful when we look at the uh, production stage to the uh, uh, sale stage. Now the last thing I would like to uh, touch on very quickly is that the traceability schemes must be adapted to the local working conditions and it helps us to be to think about the mining sector in a different manner, different fashion, and it helps us to create a mining sector that will evolve by itself with its own methods. And for me, it's very important. The economic and technical support are very essential. They are the most important for the miners who are essentially uh, looking for a way to improve their living conditions. Very quickly, uh, one last point. We are trying to start an initiative which will be tested in Colombia, and I hope that this will be replicated in Africa. It is about driving all the uh, stakeholders in the gold sector to think about a standard that will uh, be inspired from the due diligence guide and it will be an open standard that will be used by all the operators on the, in the value chain. It will be tested as a pilot initiative in Colombia. And the intention behind that is to give more capacity, more capacity to many mining sites for them to present their production to international buyers, as M M Manuel talked about earlier. And this capacity can be tested and checked at many uh, levels in the value chain. Uh, the first level as um, a self-evaluation and to other uh, aspects along the value chain. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. There are a lot of concrete aspects from that experience that are interesting, and we will uh, surely discuss this issue later when uh, the Q&A uh, session comes up. There's a word that you use uh, that leads to discussion, one of the principal factors that leads to more transparency in the supply chain. It is the building of infrastructure. The sit sites are very far. It takes days to go there. You can't check them because there is no road. And so we have to extend, expatiate uh, on the debate. And I think that the transport and communication uh, um, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, will be discussed as well. And now let's move on to the international stage with Ludovic Bernadette, who is somebody whom 
he knows very well. He was working with UNIDO before joining uh, UNEP. Now he's working, he's been working uh, on the implementation of the Minamata uh, Convention uh, that is known here in Cote d'Ivoire, which targets the reduction of mercury, mercury use. So we we'll ask Ludovic to present this initiative, the various programs to support the implementation in connection with the various uh, issues that we've been discussing so far. Well, uh, thank you. I'm Ludovic Benoda. I'm working at the uh, UN Environment Program. I am uh, the officer in charge of Mercury-related program, which is found by the uh, World Environment uh, Fund. And the theme of this panel is the strategies for a responsible environment mm -hmm. approach. And we, you know, uh, we uh, see this sector uh, in the area of the use of mercury in artisanal gold extraction, in order that uh, the artisanal mining of gold is the largest users or user of mercury in the world. It even goes beyond the uh, emission of um, gold uh, plant, uh, gold plant, and so. The international community uh, prepared a document which is uh, a legally restrictive convention on mercury uh, in, in general, and in particular, uh, they have some specific point on the uh, gold extraction uh, using um, um, uh, some, some methods. Now, in the Minamata Convention, the Minamata Convention was developed from 2010 to 2013 by 160, 186 countries, and it's a document in which all the stakeholders were consulted, uh, whether the governments or NGOs or the private sector. And in the Minamata Convention, there is a specific article that addresses the small scale mining of gold that says that the countries that notify that this sector is present in the country must develop a national action plan. So it is an obligation as per the convention. The convention was uh, prepared over the years since 2010 when it was supported uh, by the Global uh, Partnership on Mercury, which is managed by uh, UN environment, and this partnership provided uh, indication on the partners of the convention. Uh, and it is uh, done through a partnership that focuses on uh, small scale mining that are managed since 2007. And the partnership provided indications on the uh, text of the convention on appendix uh, six on article relating to article Seven, which defines the obligation of the countries and def which also, uh, in fact, the countries are encouraged and must take actions to formalize the sector and analyze mercury flows and also have to measure or analyze uh, uh, gold flows that move from one country to the other without any control, and also promote ethical uh, uh, values in the area of gold extraction. So these are dimensions that are in the Minamata Convention, and the Global uh, Mercury Partnership came with a, a documentation that was agreed to by the partners that lead the country to develop their plans to submit to the convention. Now, to give you an idea, currently we have 38 uh, countries that are signatories to the convention. Uh, they are in the pink color on the, on, the, on the card, and we have 128 countries that signed the convention on its adoption. So 128 countries have already taken actions 
to, for the implementation, and 38 have ratified. And so when we reach the number of uh, 50, the Convention will enter in force, and the Convention of Parties is expected in September of this year. And the country is in the sub-region that are uh, concerned by this workshop signed the Convention. And as you can see, here we have countries who, who, that have taken actions already to develop their national action plan with funding from the uh, Global Environment Fund, which is the uh, uh, organization uh, working on the Convention. And once again, we can see that the African con con countries are ahead as compared to other countries in this exercise because most of the countries out of the 100 and, uh, 128 uh, national no action plan uh, um, are mostly in Africa. I mean, three thirds of them. And in addition to this activity, UNEP also promotes activities on technology transfer. And recently, the financial aspect of the uh, small scale mining sector with the shortening of the value chain and the promotion, as I said, were written or found in the text of the Convention where they should find equitable sectors. So we have two sec standards, like the standard that was presented by Eve, and we're also working with, with Fair Trade and Solidaridad to uh, implement this standard. In addition to these activities, we're also working with gold refiners to enable them to have gold in the area, um, to get gold from the small scale mining sector, uh, provided they comply with the guide, the OECD guide. And as I said, there are measures to uh, refine the uh, gold from the small scale mining, and as today they ask, there is an, an, an increasing number of demand in the area of gold. And a few years ago, we wanted to get an alliance, or, or buy, we wanted to buy a, a wedding ring of, with gold. We had to go to Canada because there was no jewelries in Europe that could provide all this. Today, the biggest brand in Geneva has made, have made a demand to the refineries to provide uh, gold from artisanal mine s sectors, mine sites. And so we are working with two refiners in Switzerland. Who want to participate in our project? in order to respond to the, de to the demand from the client and to refer to the first panel of the workshop. The key uh, for these refiners to get the gold from the artisan mining is formalization. Because it's impossible to provide gold from uh, a non-formal uh, non site. Because it would not be in line with the uh, guidelines, OECD, OECD guidelines and guides, guidance. So in a few words, there's a presentation of the Minamata Convention and the link it has with um, small-scale mining sector. Thank you very much. So there's several people that were asking questions. Uh, the OECD guidance were not dealing with environmental issues. But in practic practice, that's true. The, uh, also that we have it develop a partnership with relevant international organizations to have the bridge to relate different activity and in the identified side or support program for the implementation of due diligence and the use of mercury. Is that synergy that we're trying to put in place to confirm the, the guidance document make reference to to the OECD guidance. It's a good news. Uh, thank you, Ludovic. We are now going to go closer to 
the field with Madam Test in your capacity as permanent secretary of DPICA in Cote d'Ivoire, you have garnered a good deal of experience in the, uh, in the ASM, specifically in the, all the steps being taken to remove or lift the ban and the embargo. My presentation. Uh, is outlined as follows. It has five points. First of all, the background, the institution, secondly, the institutional framework, the regulatory framework, the timeline for activities, the chronology of activity, or the time frame for activity, and the traceability system. Now, once come to the background, But before, uh, Cote d'Ivoire as small diamond producer was associated to the initiative put in place in 2000 in order to break the link between uh, diamond from conflict area and the international market. We therefore participated to all step from 2000 to 2003 where the fertility certification system of the Kimberley process come into force. But unfortunately in 2000, we suffered, uh, we experienced a crisis that stopped all activities. Due to the crisis in, in 2005, the United Nations have passed a resolution imposing a uh, ban on the trade of Ivorian Diamond. But we continued to making effort. We attended all the conferences uh, in order to voice out our concern, make people understand that uh, Cote d'Ivoire understanding, understand that the dialogue, Cote d'Ivoire is not a country, was not a country where Diamond was used to, conf to fund the conflict as we were small scale producer. If the rebels were to rely on the diamond to fund fuel the war, they would not have done it because we are a small mining country. So we made all effort to have that pan, that embargoes removed in 2014. Uh, the, regarding the Kimberley process, after the crisis, uh, in this, Cote d'Ivoire has established a permanent secretariat to manage the implementation, take care of the implementation of the Kimberley process. That secretariat was established uh, following an order of the Minister for Mining. And the secretariat is consisted of all the uh, stakeholders of the Kimberley process. At the Kimberley process, not only the Ministry for Mining, but have the marketing, the trade aspect. All the stakeholders, the relevant actors of the chain were involved, and they are participating in all activities of the Kimberley process. The Ministry uh, in charge of mining, the Minister of Interior also, as the diamonds are found in rural communities. And in rural community, we are working with sub-prefects. It was sound, good, appropriate to involve the prefectural administra territory administration to the management, be at the same level of information in order to pass on the information, the message to the community. The general directory of the customs is also involved the directorate, department at the airport in charge of the export is also involved. They are participating in uh, rating in the dialogue. The department of Re regulation and the litigation in charge of the certificate of origin as the certificate of origin is signed by both the custom office and the custom department and the Ministry of Mining. And also is engaged in the process an officer from the tax services, tax revenue services.
So the mining code is governing the PK in terms of regulatory framework. A decree, an executive order was passed in order or adopted to specify all steps, the rollout for the smooth implementation of Kimberley process. An executive order was passed, was adopted for uh, on the establishment, the operation, the, attribute, the mission of the secretariat, and an executive order, the, an order for the missions of the executive of the exec, permanent secretariat. Once established, we start working and taking step in order to have that embargo removed, lifted. Uh, I would like to commend the ambassadors accredited to this country for their support. Uh, they are uh, dubbed the group, the pool of friends of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, consisting of 12, at least 12 ambassadors, European Union being 27, bringing together 27 countries, 12 plus 27 to give more than 30 countries. The ambassador sided with us. They provided all the support in putting in place the certification system. Those ambassadors uh, carried out a visit, conducted a visit in August 2012 uh, on the ground because they wanted to see by themselves the realities on the ground in order to map out the challenges. After that landmark visit, we started raising awareness of stakeholders because after 12 years, uh, 10 years of crisis, uh, we deemed relevant to discuss with the population, exchange with them. Uh, in 2012, there was no administration in the mining produ uh, producing sector. So we need to uh, establish contact with those areas, with local community, and start working again as during the crisis several reports were produced. Uh, those community were a bit cautious. When we get closer to them, they were a bit reluctant, and we need to build trust, create trust, confidence, set up a collaborative platform in order to achieve our objective. And this is what we done, we did. Subsequently, we adopted a working plan, work plan to leading us to lifting the embargo. Even under embargo, we had to roll out action, convince the authority decision makers, telling them that Cordova was able, capable of meeting the requirement. Of course, we participated in the process, but we were not compliant as we didn't receive any team to set for certification. In May 2015, we received a delegation from African country producing mines, mine diamond. They supported us, and we seized the opportunity to initiate the internal control system in Sikala, giving, delivering the identification card to the cooperative societies. We carry on with societization, organizing capacity building meeting for all stakeholders, starting with the stakeholder, providing them explanation on what's on the Kimberley process, the expectation, the expectation, the rights, uh, they've captured the message, and they, by, they bought into our idea. Then after we build the capacity of the prefects, prefectural corp, as they are the field worker, they're working, they're living with the communities, and we explain what the Kimberley process was all about. This is what we did. Moreover, capacity building workshop was organized for customs services. 
and we solicited the World Custom Organization to send us an expert in order to build the capacities of our custom officer. In the light of all these activities, we deem that the, we did the right things to request a review for Cote d'Ivoire. We have identified all actors until the first sale point, which is namely the collector. And having done our job, we, in June 2014, during the please in Kimberley, because South Africa was heading the process, we've requested, solicited a review mission which landed in this country. I see that we carried out uh, some activities uh, and the, including the traceability of diamond. Uh, we issued document as each activity was to be support, to have support, support, need to have supporting document. The production chain from the workers, traders, importers, and so, and so on. We put in place the registration chain. All workers had to be registered and being issued a card. The miners, the exporters, had an exporter's card and the exporters had accreditation and approval. On the traceability chain, on the worker's side, as is explained for, for the case of Sydney, we have monitors on the underground because the mine diamond are put in an envelope. This is an element in order to ensure traceability. On the level of the miners, the diamond is registered in the production uh, registry. Uh, the collector is given a receipt for traceability of the tr transaction carried out, and the same apply to the purchase, the purchase center, which is the only one to export dialogue. Uh, after the uh, evaluation, we issue a certificate for the Kimberley process. Thank you. So, uh, still have half an hour to for discussion, open discussion. So the floor is open for those who would like to raise an issue or ask a question or entertain question. Madam, the second row. Good morning. My name is Saul Admari, Director National Director for the National Office of Expertise in, of the Republic of Guinea. Okay, it's just all about artisanal producer who can sell their product to the refiners. I don't know if this is the case in other countries. In Guinea, it's not possible. Uh, so far as we have regulated the commercialization, the export of gold in my country, the artisanal producers is selling its product to the collector, selling it to the, uh, the counter the, who so in the case of Guinea, it has to go closer to the counter or the counter top rather than the mining artisanal miners. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm Samuel Koroma from uh, Sierra Leone. I work for the National Minerals Agency. I want to thank all the speakers since yesterday to date. They've been very interesting and it has been a learning event. Uh, there are two things that caught my eye and I think I should delve a little bit about them. Due diligence and traceability. I think they are very key for ASM operations. But what I did not hear about is, maybe I did not get that back, but I did not hear anything about taxation. 
because um, if you're talking about due diligence, you're talking about traceability, and you should also have the element of smuggling to be captured. Because if, for example, tariffs are not harmonized, my own tariffs are lower or yours are higher, there is a tendency that smuggling will, will increase or it will, people will move from the ASM area in your neighborhood to another country, say, for example, Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire or Sierra Leone and Liberia. And from my own personal investigation, I've learned that the gold tariffs for at a, uh, from alluvia exports are not uniform. In the case of gold in the Mano River Union countries, they are. But in the case of gold, I mean, for diamonds in the Mano River Union countries, they are. But in the case of gold, they are not. So I think this is one thing we should think about to factor if we really want to trace, to, to get a proper picture for traceability. Because if you don't harmonize your tariffs, as it's been done in diamond, you might get uh, smuggled gold coming from point A to point B. And I don't think that would be a good element that you would call traceability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, intervention. Indeed, it's, it's a key, f I mean, taxation is, is covered by due diligence uh, processes and guidance. And this element is a key um, element of uh, harmonization and, and, and a way to fight um, illegal smuggling of, of gold. So I guess the panelists will talk on that as well. Uh, on va passer à Johan et ensuite on reviendra comme ça. I would like to fo follow up um, on the question of my brother. It's uh, an orthodox question. My question goes to the moderator. Since we are in a region which knows the traceability uh, in the context of Kimberley process, what is the distinction between the traceability and due diligence? Uh, in my understanding, the due diligence can include traceability uh, as a tool that will serve the due diligence, but traceability in, uh, uh, per se is not the due diligence. It is not sufficient. It's important that you provide clarity, provide explanation, give us a distinction between uh, the two points. As we are talking about embargo, and it's important to make that a distinction. Thank you, Joan. I would like to make it brief. Of course, traceability is a traceability system that will fit into the due diligence. The due diligence is a process that aims to collect information, analyze information, and the documentation of the traceability system cannot be considered as part of that can only be considered as part of the information because there are other sources of information that are part of the information. Due diligence is also when identifying a risk, we mitigate it. It's not only uh, subscribing, buying into a, a, subscribing to a traceability system, being given a certificate. There is an intervention uh, by the company in order to mitigate the risk on the ground. As well stated, traceability can be part of due diligence, but no way can not replace, can replace it. There was a first question for on the harmonization of the fiscal system, taxation system. Thank you for your question. Uh, that's true, that is really a challenge. Uh, when there are national legislation which is allowing a refiner to go and buy from miners. I don't know the answer, but I think that is relevant, it's good, to consider the impact it may have on the initiative. Because so many times refiners are working with organization on the project and the initiatives that they cannot buy and work directly from the miners. This can process, uh, slow down the progress. There is another element which, which is key. The refiners are compliant with the national law. This is the basis. In 
the international standard, there is a strong recommendation that effort should be made in order to reduce the middlemen. The number of middlemen that is creating the opacity, creating opportunity for corruption or bribery. There is one recommendation of the standard and discussing with the regional country to say how do we articulate the international standard. This can be part of uh, the topic that can be discussed in the future. Who would like to answer the question on the taxation? Thank you. The question of due diligence and diligence and taxation as noted, the issue of illegal taxation are part of the requirement of OECD due diligence guidance. The, based on the experience in our region, I'm um, seconding your viewpoint. There is no harmonization of taxation. This can result in smuggling from one country to another, from one border to another. There are legal taxation and illegal taxation. Legal taxation can be harmonized by the different country, but illegal taxation represents an incidence that must be reported. The such um, are leading to meaning the local, provincial, national committee as part of the traceability are playing a role. Their role is to inform the both national and international community on uh, the misconduct. Uh, regarding taxation, legal taxation. The first thing is to identify the legally established tax by the government and the other official entity. Therefore, thereafter, the stakeholder will identify the legal taxation. We can identify without precondition as risk identification when it's happened how the stakeholders respond. When they identify, they can either write to the government telling the government that they have identified social taxes in a specific area, the incidents will be uh, reported, uh, identified, and resolved. I do agree that if you don't harmonize the taxation system, this might encourage people to smuggle or to cross border and go and sell the products. We conducted a study in Burkina Faso of how the artisanal gold is leaving the country, where it is produced. When the taxation, the taxes are high, the taxes are high, it can encourage the smuggling. Our works indicate, us, highlight that the when the taxes are high, I mean, six percent on production and seven percent on the export, we this can result in a market of uh, some people, dealers, willing to bypass the uh, go around the system. Uh, gold is a financial product, allowing the enabling people to import product. So we have a sharp competition, and we need to be careful about it, as even with goodwill, it will be difficult for us to uh, wipe out such network, and it's good to have coordinating uh, answer at the regional level, as we found in that study that several uh, con a good quantity of good were uh, smuggled into Togo and then to Asia and the Middle East. So how can we fix all these issues, remedy, address all these, uh, let's say, behaviors, attitudes, practices that are not good for the development of the sector, that are undermining the national regulation because it's more easy, it's easier buying 
commodity with gold than with money. My name is Sophia Pico. I'm working for uh, a British NGO called Global Witness. Um, happy to be attending this meeting, having listened to all the input today and yesterday. It's a key moment discussing for the, this is a good platform to discuss uh, the Ivorian supply chain and the supply chain of the war region. I said in the morning there is a regulation of the European Union that will come into force uh, shortly on the input, which is good in terms of import and export. What I would like to underscore, in this morning said the OECD due diligence guidance has turned an international uh, standard which is expected by the end users. And as a member of the civil society, uh, I'd like to highlight, point to the importance of third party monitoring, independent monitoring, monitoring from civil society. It's uh, an important element for building trust, for the implementation of the due diligence. My question is the following. I mean, I'm uh, uh, happy to be part of the discussion, but uh, maybe I, may, I missed some details. Uh, what will be practical steps taken by the Ivorian government to implement, to enforce the due diligence uh, guidance? I don't know whether it's a question for the panel or somebody within the house that can provide answer. What are the practical uh, steps to be taken if we are to do it. In our experience in the Great Lake region, we've realized that it was important to create at the beginning a database of companies, businesses, of what they're doing as activity in order to uh, appraise the progress made by the company. If somebody can provide more information, it will be good. Going to pick one, two, three question. My name is Professor Yapu from the Ministry of Environment. I'm the, the director of Central Laboratory for Environment of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, I'd like to commend the Minister of Mining, who I have selected to associate the Minister to join the Ministry of Environment to the panel. I've listened uh, to the presentation. I've viewed and watched the presentation. Most of the presentation focus on traceability of minerals, collaboration between the mining and the population, how to socialize the activity, but I haven't seen the any good uh, consideration for the environmental aspect. So there are also, how do you restore, reclaim the site that I abandoned? Do we, do we have success stories? I want you to elaborate a bit on them. In the presentation of Mr. Bertrand, he uh, emphasized the environmental friendly Gold. Why the environmental aspect, the ecological aspect, is not well captured in dealing with the minerals? My name is Andrea Yao from Sega Resources, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, uh, producer. I have concern in as over these three days, the process, the process will lead to a certification, and certification implies cost. In terms cost, who is going to bear the cost? Several NGOs having their headquarters in the developed country, those NGOs are not uh, defending the right of producers. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that this process will uh, impoverish, uh, further impoverish the producer. Then we'll be talking about the market as 
where in the cocoa sector where produce, cocoa farmers are getting poorer. I'm afraid that this process will be uh, beneficial for developed countries and we produce a developing country we stay poor. My name is Dominique Bali from Environmental Health Agency in Central Africa, and we're working with the government in implementing, enforcing the Minemata obligation, its obligation in, prepar in preparing a national plan. We're working with four countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, Burundi, Congo, and also Guinea and even Niger. Well, part of my concern were was voiced out by Professor Yapo, uh, including the activity of restoration of abandoned sites. I'd like to go back on, back on the fact. Most of the presentation of African countries show there are uh, risks related to the use of chemicals such as the cyanide. And We've even seen the example of Niger, but in the due diligence document presented by OECD, once it comes to risk identification, there are two major risks mentioned. The uh, risks related to the financing of armed conflict and the one related to human rights. The fact of manipulating chemical product without production uh, is a violation of the right of the workers or the right to have a safe living condition. This should be identified as a major risk. This, maybe it will come in a revised mind. This should be taken into account in order to sanitize, to make, to have a responsible sector. RMRC, in this study in Burkina Faso, have uh, taken it into account. But I've noted a fact. In the gap related to the uh, in 2000, in, in, at the level of CAF, we are at 30 percent, and today we are at 70 percent. If we conduct an audit, the gap will be at 80, 90 percent, because even if chemicals are banned by national legislation, the, we have a growing use, increasing use of those products. So with the support from UNEP, we start manage to implement that program. I don't know if you were here on Wednesday, but we said that the OECD guidance is part of uh, a broader document which, taking it, which is covering the environmental issue. What the OECD guidance is doing is to focus the attention of the company on the severe risk for human, human being. I'm not uh, downplaying the environmental aspect, but uh, all stakeholders have agreed that the most severe risk for human being is related to the human rights violation and the financing of armed group once again this group risk is not sidelined. One way of taking it into account or factoring it, as indicated by uh, Olivier, is to establish bridge with international organizations who are dealing with that subject. Uh, and uh, the due diligence of, as mentioned, is not certification. It has, not, it has nothing to do with traceability. What we want to get closer to the economic condition of operator and the implementation of due diligence is not necessarily, not necessarily go through the requirement of a certificate of, as I emphasized the point on Wednesday, ask question, collect information, understand the context and disseminate information. And the, the European Union is based on that system. It will not be fundamentally based uh, printing of a certificate that can be costly for producers. It can be a solution tailored to the uh, so the the matters, but uh, this is not what the guidance is pushing for. We we'll move to the question on the environment, and we will see who from the government to answer the question as raised by the representative of the 
NGO. Few questions on site restoration, environmental component in the different discussion, as rightly mentioned, for the mining, gold mining, mercury and cyanide, as mentioned by Dominic, are uh, used in the site. And the Convention of Minamata uh, set out some restrictions, some obligation in the annex of the convention, to the convention, making reference, referring to the artic, article on ASM, the more polity, environmental polity method uh, ban. The country who signed the convention and which has to develop a national plan should uh, ban uh, the activity, the combination, amalgamation, or uh, the uh, burning of amalgamation in the open air. But for the site restoration, once again, the site reclamation, the convention uh, has a, an article on the contaminated site. Uh, currently, the practical aspect uh, of the enforcement of this article was not negotiated as the convention is yet to come into force. It will come into force indeed in September, but a work on the identification of contaminated site and restoration is, uh, will, is also important. So we work with country in order to address the issue regarding the use of mercury and other chemicals. And to what Ludovic has said, for rehabilitation, what's important is let us allow mining businesses, organization, uh, mining organization, uh, company to get organized, or mining worker to get organized. They cannot work in silos, somebody in isolation. They have to come together. Acquisition of expertise in cash management and account, uh, accounting and so on. So only in mining and planning are the mining activity that will be able to fix some issue that we can fix some of most of the problem regarding the restoration. Uh, so that, this also do uh, relate to the ability or capability uh, ability of miners to handle, to manage a mining site. Thank you. Uh, first of, firstly, I would like to buttress uh, that the initiative taken at the international level are built on national policies. It's come and strengthen the policies of different government in handling the sector. All, all the policies of the government on the issue of SAM management is strengthened by those international initiatives. That's why national government are the implementing uh, stakeholders. I'd like to specify the difference, make, provide clarity on the concept used. We move from certific certification, traceability, and due diligence. Due diligence. So what is the issue we want to solve and consider the development of the sector as a process. Where do we start? Who can activate effect on others' processes? The, the method of the certification has around 2011, 21 standards, which include traceability, environmental aspect, health, and uh, environmental rehabilitation. Traceability is only a tool or an element, means which allows, uh, allows, enable us to trace a product from a point A to a point B. The issue of environmental rehabilitation is not sidelined by the different stakeholder in the supply chain must know where the role is. For a mind to comply with the 21, 20, 
one standard requires uh, having a process. So to do so, we need to take measures against illegal uh, mining, illegal trade, the worst form of child labor, child labor. Uh, I have an example where we started from traceability. Uh, they are automatically restored from the environmental perspective. Thank you. Take. I don't know if I've, I've captured the question. The lady wanted to know if the Côte d'Ivoire has initiated an application, started implementing the OECD guideline. The answer is simple. For the time being, we are yet to take an initiative is the answer that I can give. We have not taken initiative. The guidance is new. It's a new document. What the ministry is doing is to read, read and digest the guidance before uh, pass, uh, taking any step. My brother, Professor Yapo, said now, since yesterday, we didn't talk about environment. We didn't cover the environmental issue. I'm not... Uh, this is not right. If you go back to the presentation made by the technical advisor to the Ministry of Mining, it's indicated as part of the outlooks and for the specific case of Cote d'Ivoire, we have decided to fill the walls, to fill the walls, the, the holes. The environmental aspect is well covered, well captured in the presentation. To be specific, we indicated, we said, that the LSM uh, semi-industrial, the LSM need to produce a study for environmental impact studies. For OECD, we remain at your disposal to provide more clear, further clarity on the different point. My name is Sek, but I'm Dao from the Ministry of Mining Industry of Cote d'Ivoire. Just raised two questions. Louis Marshall has, le has left. Oh, no, I'm here, I'm here. Louis Marshall is there. I want to find out. You mentioned this OECD standard, but in your presentation, you have not. Uh, specified sanctions to be taken up, penalties, in case you realize that demands come from conflict areas. My second question goes to Madame Manuela. You talked about refineries, refinery system, but I didn't see in your presentation, didn't come out in your presentation, measures to relocate these refineries at the sub-regional level, because as this is more profitable in Africa. In the mining vision, the objective to have the refining of those minerals in our region. Have you taken measure for this uh, unit, refinery, to be relocated in Africa? Thank you. I have two comments. The first comment is on the presentation. I would like to thank the presenters for the substance of the presentation and batteries uh, support those who are coaching and mentoring the artisan as this is an important element in what we're doing because the end, the objective is to formalize the activities once the artisan, the miners, uh, benefit from it and they can comply with the laws, it will encourage conformity, compliance, because they see a uh, benefit in what they are doing. The second comment is on the use of technology, as this can be useful in terms of uh, 
handling the issues of legal tax, illegal tax. Today you have mobile for using mobile phone for payment uh, that the excavators can use. We have established agreement with uh, telcos because they have some payment system. Only legal tax can be requested from them because the illegal tax is not done through that payment system. So let us consider how technology can help us fix some anti-corruption measures. <coughs> Mr. Soro Umar from the uh, Mining Cooperative of Cote from Cote The question goes directly to the expert who talked about Mercury's. In our legislations, I don't know whether the point is well captured or not. This provision exists in all the mining codes. Is it due to the international pressure that we are factoring them in to be compliant with international standards? But in practice, mercury and cyanide are the most used element for the mining, for the extraction of concentrated minerals. With, in view of all the technological advances, can't we come up with a responsible method to mine the gold with the mercury or the cyanide and that we train the miners or the workers for those elements to avoid use for those elements to stop being harmful for the environment. I am Devajit Sah from Bullion Bullet in India. Sir, my question is, uh, as we are talking about responsible guidance, traceability, see, as far as my understanding, uh, authority who can enforce the regulation, can you can anticipate a very good result. For example, LVMA has imposed the uh, responsible, com uh, compulsory responsible auditing for all its LVMA good delivery refiners, if I am wrong, and uh, they can do it with iron hand. But beyond this LVMA list of good delivery refiners, there are hundreds of refiners. Uh, how we can enforce some regulations so that all these refineries, uh, wh whenever they are sourcing gold from artisanal sources or any other sources, we can keep a we can keep an eye or we can create an organization globally who can work as a watchdog to enforce that responsible guideline across the world. Thank you. Um, I'll take the question, answer the question on the sanction related to the last intervention. The OECD is not an organization who is sanctioning. The OECD is, is uh, producing voluntary standards, opt-out standards. Some member standard, some member countries of OECD and some state in West Africa and Central Africa have decided to draw on those international standards and translate, build or prepare a national standard. We did the European Union, I don't know whether the representative of European Union here to cover the issue. It's provided that some, some member states may take sanction to support the enforcement. But this is not done. The issue of the members state of the OECD, OECD member state. Thank you, Liu. I want to give an example of sanction as part of the treaty. If we identify in your supply chain that you get sourced from the conflict areas, your mineral will not be accepted at the international level market because there will be documentation need. We'll ban you from the system. We'll remove your name and sideline your business. The first sanction is economic sanction. Uh, So 
So, in Dear Congo, the Minister of passed an order obliging all the business to abide by the due diligence. Uh, the government can remove your permit, your license, if you fail to comply. Thank you for the question on the sanction. I wanted to focus, emphasize that point. Our refiners, if they don't comply with our principles and the standards of OECD, they are deleted from the list. If they are deleted from the list, they cannot sell the European Union uh, market. If they are denied access to that market, they will suffer a loss, a loss, because they cannot generate revenue. There are so to be financial constraint and a, and a challenge for them in terms of their reputation, because there are other markets that you, that are using our standard to decide whether gold can enter the market or not. So any uh, refiner who is not compliant will suffer consequences. This is the fifth year, five year of the guide. We have delisted, delisted, uh, removed f four refiners from the list. A new principle is that once you are removed, you are delisted. You cannot apply. It, you cannot apply. You can not be reintegrated until you pay after five year. It's kind of a response to your question as well because it means basically that it's all the stakeholders around the OECD that are basically adopting sanctions that they deem fit, um, be it the European Union, be it Central African countries, be it market uh, operators. Um, it's not only limited to the LBMA. There, there is also a program running, running in Dubai. Uh, we have discussions with the Chinese authorities uh, ar around this as well on gold. Um, I'm sure that with your support, we'll have those discussions in India um, someday. So, yeah, basically the, the enforcement aspect of this due diligence process is, is progressing as well. So, um, the next question, la prochaine question, c'était sur le, encore une fois, sur le mercure. Uh, the, uh, the next question is on mercury, which is an extensively covered issue. I'm sorry if my communication was not clear. The Minimata Convention, the does not recommend country to ban mercury, but to mitigate the emission. In the gold mining sector, the miner can still use, continue to use the mercury, but there are some limits. If they continue to use it, they make sure they don't use it in area where people live, that the burning is not done in the open air, for recycling the mercury. If they want to use cyanide, the cyanide, they cannot, as the cyanide is more polluting than uh, releasing, discharging mercury in the environment. To do so, countries who negotiate the convention have also negotiated a financial instrument, an uh, article for technical assistance, provision for technical assistance, enabling country to uh, be up to its obligation. The other point is development of national plan as described in my presentation. Just to give you a practical example, in the project presented by Eve, uh, we uh, for we, whom uh, which I was responsible for the technical part. In Burkina Faso, the Maya were extracting mining gold by amalgamation, and with their effort, they were mining, extracting 30% of gold. 70% of gold were lost <coughs> in the waste. The, our intervention initiative trained the Miners, the workers who mine the gold to extract gold uh, without mercury, 
and uh, having a good project. At the end of the project, they have doubled the production, their production, uh, mounting to 75% without using mercury. So the workers, the miners, buy into the techniques so that they bought a new set of equipment. This is an evidence that we have a practical example which shows that we can uh, mitigate or why not ban the, mitigate the environmental pollution through use of mercury. We're going to wrap up here for this morning. A few elements that I've noted, key element of our discussion. It's important to adapt to local practices to make sure that international standards are enforced. So it's important both for negotiating the standard and implementing the standard. And it's also good that the private sector get involved uh, alongside the government to implement practical activity. Involvement of the private sector can need to do, should be done through creating incentive and being able to sanction. So due to the peculiarity of each country, uh, we can package initiative. When So the mining sector contribute a lot, normally actually a lot to the economy of, economy of the country, but um, unfortunately there are some uh, production well, which are not captured. Uh, the good knowledge of the sector is good. Regulatory policies are key and I uh, welcome the presentation on the synergy that can be built with this. We've covered the session of the morning. Thank you for your question, for your inputs. Uh, we're going to break for lunch. Thank you.